Hi all. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, if you see my lips moving and you don't hear me but are an excellent lip reader, please uh, type into the chat to let me know that you can or can hear me. Uh, we will be going as quickly as we can through everything today to uh, try to get an opportunity to uh, allow you to ask questions specific about your uh, research or what you're thinking about submitting for the, uh, thanks Devin, uh, or what you may be thinking about submitting for the research initiation grants today. Um, based on just the introductions I see in the chat box so far, I think we'll go through the gamut. We'll go through the whole thing related to the rigs um, to give you a background on what they are, what the purpose of them uh, is, uh, as well as giving you some tips and hints for the best way to construct your proposal to submit it and hopefully uh, obtain a research initiation grant from COIL. Uh, I will start off by apologizing first. Uh, I am actually on paternity leave for right now. I haven't been in the office for two weeks and I have another week uh, before I return. Uh, but because I run the research initiation grant process for COIL, I felt like it, I, I should be the one uh, performing these these overviews. So uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, hopefully I don't have too large of uh, bags under my eyes. I've got a, a two-year-old and a week and a half or two-week-old in the house right now. Uh, so that is my attire, and you'll notice this is this is not my Zen office at work. This is uh, my home office. Uh, so uh, a little bit of other house, uh, housekeeping. If you want to turn on your microphone, please do so. Uh, you feel uh, feel free. I activated your microphones, uh, and Michael, I'm actually doing that for you right now. I activated microphones for everybody. All you will have to do is click on the microphone icon at the top of your screen. Uh, it should turn green. If you have a microphone connected or built in, uh, it should be activated. I do ask that you mute it when you're not speaking. Uh, that way we don't have clicking of keyboards and things like that. Uh, but if you want to ask questions that way, please do so. If you want to type them into the chat box, that's great as well. Uh, if you want to click on the raised hand icon at the top of the connect session, uh, you can click that and I will keep an eye on uh, on that as we're going along. It's actually on my other screen right here, so if you see me looking away, that's that's what I'm doing is checking those boxes. Uh, finally, I encourage questions. Uh, one of the points of this session is to make certain that we give you a bit of an inside track on, on the rigs, and we, uh, we uh, make that available to everyone uh, that is interested. A theme that you will hear throughout uh, what we're talking about today is that we want to be as transparent as possible. And when I say we, I mean Center for Online Innovation and Learning. We want to be as transparent as possible and to give you the greatest opportunity to get your research funded through the research initiation grant process. Uh, we want to find innovative ideas here at Penn State. We know, that we know they're there. We know there's innovative research going on all over the place. Uh, we want to help to bring resources to bear on those ideas. Uh, and the best way of doing it is making certain that you can communicate your research idea or development idea as well as possible in the proposal to get funded. One of the things I often say to, uh, to our proposers after the fact, after the research is done and who, uh, funding has been decided on, I often say, you know, it's not necessarily just the research that is funded. It's the proposal that is funded. You can often have a wonderful research or development idea but if it's not communicated in just the right way for the particular reviewers that we have uh, on this process, it may not be funded. You have to communicate certain things in order to get that funding. And we'll talk about what that funding is and the purpose of it in just a few minutes. Me, uh, my name is Brad Allen Zdenek. I work for the Center for Online Innovation and Learning. I'm an educational strategist. I also happen to run the research initiation grant process uh, for, for COIL. Uh, Kyle Peck, uh, my, and myself, Kyle Peck being one of our co-directors and myself, uh, really take the lead on the entire process, both the call for proposals, the review of the proposals. We are the ones that bring it uh, to the table for the rest of the COIL co-directors to look over the suggestions from the review committee and decide on which proposals are, go proposals are going to be funded uh, during each cycle. We have two cycles each year. Uh, both of them can fund up to $50,000 per grant. Uh, generally, we have had, uh, let me say in the last two cycles, we've averaged about 37000 I believe, in funding for each one of the research uh, proposals. So you'll see we can fund up to 50000 We have We have uh, one proposal that is 49997 That was convenient. Uh, and we've had some uh, down in the five $6,000 range. Uh, so they run the gamut. 
and obviously the uh, the review process is tailored in such a way that it uh, it has more focused on cost effectiveness for those more expensive research grants and it gives a little bit more leeway for those that are asking for a little bit less. But we'll get into those details in a minute. Hopefully you should see a screen share uh, right now of the COIL website with its uh, little rotating banner uh, just below my head here. And this is the COIL website which is at coil.psu.edu and I will type that in here so if you want to click on the hyperlink uh, to go through the site with me on, on another monitor uh, as we're going along that's great otherwise you'll be able to see exactly what I'm doing here on the screen. The research initiation grant process is one of the things that the Center for Online Innovation Learning here at Penn State does. Uh, it's one of our larger initiatives uh, and currently we have 27 uh, research proposals that have been funded. Of those, uh, we still have about 20 that are active. Uh, we're in a, a gray area right now where some are winding down and, and funding is ended because not every single research proposal starts on the exact same date. Uh, but for the most part, we keep about 20, 25 of them running at any particular time. Uh, and as I said, they range anywhere from 5000 up to $50,000. If you are interested in the specifics of the rigs, if you're looking at us uh, proposing for this spring uh, round, which the due date for this spring round is May 15th, you will find all of the information, including the background, on one of the tabs on our website. And that's where we'll go to now, and that's where we'll spend most of our time today. So here under grants on our website, coil.psu.edu, you will see the call for rig proposals. This is our RFP. We don't send out a, a PDF copy. It is a live web document uh, that we update immediately following each one of the rig cycles uh, to reflect any changes that will be for the next rig cycle. So that's where I was saying if you're looking at proposing for this uh, spring round, your proposals are due close of business on May 15th. That means 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on May 15th. And the the uh, RFP for that round, the specifics of what we're going to be uh, using to review your proposal are all on this page right here. So the, the, the big question, the broad question is, what are these grants? What are they for? Well, the idea when COIL first came into being, uh, boy, two and a half years ago now, uh, when COIL first came into being was we wanted, we did not feel that there was a broad mechanism anywhere at Penn State for funding innovative ideas to provide seed funding for innovative ideas related to online learning. But not online learning specifically, online innovations in learning. And the distinction there is that online innovations in learning, which is what we are, the Center for Online Innovation in Learning, Online innovations in learning have to do with the leveraging of online technologies for any sort of learning. That may mean that your research or development project is specifically focused on a traditional face-to-face -face environment, but the innovation or the innovative thing that you're looking at researching or developing has to do with using an online tool or an online process inside of that traditional face-to-face -face structure. So just because it is not online learning does not mean that it is not appropriate for this grant. In, in fact, many of the rigs that we have funded have, have, have very little to do with online learning. They have to do with online innovations that focus on learning or impact learning. So that's what we're looking at doing. We're looking at providing, providing seed funding for the development or proof of concept stages of these research and development projects. Now, uh, as I mentioned, this is research or development. Uh, it can be either, and we'll get into the specifics of that as we look at uh, the criteria that we have for, for proposals, and that'll be fleshed out a little bit more there. Uh, eligibility, and you'll notice we're kind of going to run down this list right here, the eligibility deadlines and such. Uh, you can click on any of these and go to all of these separate sections if you want a refresher after this, after this is over, uh, and we'll give you all of the details in each one of these sections. But eligibility relate, is directly related to you know, what these things are. These are for faculty, staff, and or students uh, anywhere at Penn State 
that is any Penn State campus, uh, there is a terrible tendency uh, for some to think of Penn State as University Park. That is not the case here. In fact, we highly encourage our Commonwealth campuses to submit, and we have a number of rigs that uh, PIs are from the Commonwealth campuses, as well as additional team members being from the Commonwealth campuses or additional team members from other universities, uh, nonprofit groups, uh, uh, for-profit groups, industry. Team members, collaborative, diverse teams are highly encouraged. The only thing that we require is that the PI, the principal investigator, is a faculty, staff, or student at Penn State somewhere. If you are faculty, staff, or student, you can submit into this online uh, submission system, which I'll, I'll show you in a few minutes. You can submit your proposal. It's a relatively short proposal. Uh, and then we have a very, very quick turnaround for review of these. If you've ever done anything for NSF or IES, or if that, that's my background in education, uh, you will be very used to six-month turnarounds uh, before you hear a word back on a proposal. Uh, even for some smaller scale grants, you can often expect for two, three months uh, between when you submit and when you hear anything back. We have a three week turnaround time from submission date until you hear whether or not your project has been funded. Uh, we, we work very hard during that submission period to make absolutely certain that we, that we go through these proposals as quickly and as thoroughly as possible in order to get the money into your hands. We don't want to be red tape. We don't want to be in the way of you doing what you need to do, the innovation that you want to pursue, because this is innovation. We're on the edge here. If we take our time, we're no longer going to be on the edge. Uh, we have many projects where if they were pushed six, eight months down the road, we would have missed the ship. Uh, there would have been other groups that had done some of this research. So what we want to do is get this, the money into your hands as quickly as possible. We do all that we can for that. So the deadlines, as I mentioned, May 15th is a deadline for this submission period. We also have a fall round. We have two submission periods per year. November 16th is the second. If you don't think that you will have a proposal ready for May 15th, I would highly recommend submitting to be a reviewer for the May 15th cycle. Uh, and you can find that if you go back up into grants, uh, you will see volunteer as a rig reviewer. I would highly recommend uh, volunteering as a rig reviewer so that, uh, I'll answer your question in just a second, Andrew, uh, so that you can get a sense of how this process works. Uh, if you are sitting in on that review committee, what will happen is you will be in on the discussions and you will hear the questions that we are throwing at our reviewers. You will see, well, you can see the rubric, whether you're a reviewer or not. We, we supply that to, to all proposal proposers as well. Uh, but you'll get a, a, a deeper sense of how to best structure your proposal for funding. Uh, so again, if you're looking at submitting for November, please think about uh, putting in as a reviewer for May. Uh, we will have that, uh, that volunteer form up until about May 10th. Uh, so we go up right to the line with uh, asking for reviewers. Uh, and I'll talk about how that review team is put together in a minute. So three weeks to acceptance, how long until money is in hand. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the Penn State red tape. Uh, what happens upon funding decisions, uh, once we decide on funding, then we have to put uh, your college's FO or department's FO financial officer uh, in contact with world campuses uh, or outreaches FO, uh, which is where COIL is, is housed. And then once they work out the, the details, uh, money can come into hand as soon as that's done. We've had that process go as quickly as another three weeks. Uh, and we've had some that have drug out uh, and there have been problems or, uh, or the like, uh, but generally it has never been more than, than another month and a half, six weeks. Uh, so generally what we'll do is in late June, I would say by, by mid to late June, money should be in hand. Uh, and what one of the benefits now, this is going to be our, our seventh uh, rate cycle. One of the benefits now is that many FOs from across the university have already worked with us and we've worked out most of many of the bugs. Uh, so when you come to them and say, hey, I just got a, a, a COIL rig grant and we contact them saying, hey, uh, you, 
we we have a new uh, rig PI in your in your college, they're able to get that process rolling right away. Uh, so it's pretty quick turnaround. So funding. So I told you 50, up to fifty thousand dollars. The question is, what can you use that money for? Uh, the money can be used for a number of different things, and we keep some of this purposefully diffuse. We we purposefully don't. Uh, uh, fence this in because again we're talking about innovations here uh, so we want to give some leeway for perhaps uh, ways of spending the money that we haven't thought of however there are some restrictions that that we place on the money and, and for good reasons I'll explain those right here so the rig grant uh, funds can be used to support the development of any sort of new technology learning tool or environment so this is web development this is programming time this is hardware uh, we've got one rig right now that is building a haptic feedback glove uh, where you slip this glove on and you can interact with a 3d virtual world and due to the haptic feedback you could actually feel virtual things uh, that you're interacting with uh, they have a, a science lab where you can pick up components and make them interact with each other and you can feel them in your hands uh, and feel them click together due to these gloves uh, so the money that you need to spend on building something like that whether for fifty thousand dollars it's probably going to be a prototype uh, but building some sort of, of of tool or it could be something virtual that's a piece of software or an app um, the money can be used for that it can be used for the research to investigate those types of tools or environments or uh, hardware or software. Uh, so that's research, design, and consultation. You need a statistician. You need to buy out some of their time. Uh, somebody to do data collection for you. That's great. You need someone to do data analysis. Fantastic. Uh, any of those types of personnel needs that you may need to actually conduct the research side of things. Uh, any money that you may need for collaboration with innovators or researchers in the field. So what we mean by this is, uh, say the leader in the field related to your research project happens to be uh, across the the uh, across the United States and is at University of California, uh, San Diego, and you want to bring that person in. To your lab to spend a couple days with you to work on whatever piece of hardware you're generating you need some travel to bring them in that's a perfectly fine use of of the money in order to to facilitate collaboration we've also had people who have used it to buy a subscription to zoom for a period of time uh, so or we have Adobe Connect at Penn State but some people like zoom better so they got zoom in order to use for a collaborative team and bring them together for for meetings things of, of that sort Travel to support research activity, that's going out and doing data collection and the like if you need it. Uh, or to meet with potential external funding sources. One of the purposes of this seed funding is not just to get a prototype of something in, in, in your hands or, or to affect learning here at Penn State. That is a goal, a, a, a large goal of these research initiation grants is to make sure that we're positively impacting learning here at Penn State. But we also recognize that $50,000 isn't going to get you to the goal. $50,000 is going to get you 10 yards down, down the field. What we allow you to do is to spend some of the money to go out and meet with external funding sources, whether it be you know, an AT&T or a Gates Foundation or whatever you may think of, uh, to go out and meet with them in order to court some of this external funding. Uh, obviously most of the money needs to be spent on actually building something or creating something or researching something but if you need to reach out to external funding sources and have those initial meetings you can use some of your money for that technologies or equipment required by the project that you don't normally have this is one of those okay this is what your money can't be spent on we put it in the positive in here let me put it in the in the uh, the other way for you if you are faculty or staff here at Penn State, it is expected that you will already have a laptop or a desktop computer that Penn State has provided to you uh, for use during your research or during your uh, regular work. There is no reason that you should have to use COIL funds in this rig to buy yourself a second laptop for this project. Perhaps there's a particular reason. You need a specialized server for what you're doing or you need a particular tablet for the app development that you're doing. 
you can make cases for it. But what we don't want to do here is we don't want to be funding you buying the next generation of laptop because you just don't like your laptop anymore and you want a new one. Uh, we want to be good stewards of the money here. And this is Penn State money going for Penn State research. We want to make sure that it's spent in the best way possible. Uh, so if you are putting in for things that you should already have, such as a laptop, uh, you would want to put into the narrative of your proposal why you're asking for that. Give us some sort of justification for asking for that piece of equipment you should already have. You can use the money for staff compensation time, uh, so that's your normal hourly rates uh, as well as your fringe, or wages uh, for wage payroll individuals. So if you have to buy out some staff time, you can use that. If you want to hire somebody as a wage payroll, you can do that. Graduate assistance, great. In fact, we cover tuition and stipend. Uh, that's perfectly fine use of the uh, rig money, and in fact, that's most of where the money has gone in the projects we've funded, is to bring in graduate assistants to do this work. Uh, and if you've ever hired a graduate assistant before, you know how expensive uh, that is and how quickly those expenses increase. Uh, so this is a good use of a portion of the, the money for your research initiation grant. As well as if you are faculty or you're bringing in faculty on the research team, uh, faculty comp I'm sorry, faculty compensation during the summer months. So if you are a 10-month employee but you want to work over that summer, we can uh, cover that faculty time during the summer months. What we don't want to do, and this is this last bullet here, what we don't want to do is we would very much prefer not to use this money for faculty buyout time during the spring and uh, fall sessions. A couple reasons for this. Number one, faculty here at Penn State have a fair amount of research time built into their duties. Uh, research time is a given for most faculty, and we expect that research time to be used on these grants. We also don't want to be spending money to pull good uh, teachers and faculty out of the classrooms. We don't want to be pulling you away from students, uh, because the focus here is on learning. And if we're pulling you away from, from direct interaction with your students, that may not be the best use of this funding or this time. Uh, perhaps, again, that can be shifted to the summer, or perhaps some of that workload can be shifted off to graduate assistants uh, or, or others. Uh, so again, I'm not saying it can't be used for that, but if you do allocate any sort of time for faculty buyout during the summer, or I'm sorry, during the spring or fall sessions, make sure that you provide a pretty solid justification for doing so. Funding priorities, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to read most of this because you can go through and read this. Uh, what I'm going to do is kind of get us to the criteria for the proposals pretty quickly uh, so that we can spend most of our time on that because I think that's where really where the meat of this is. Uh, but funding priorities, you can read that here. Uh, funding guidelines, um, up to $50,000. I told you that. This says we anticipate eight proposals of cost of 25000 that's probably not true anymore. Uh, again, our average for the last couple of years has been 37. Uh, so generally what we will do is we will fund roughly $225,000 per cycle. Uh, so depending on how that splits up, if we have, if our best projects are all $50,000 projects, obviously we're not going to be funding as many. We'll fund four projects. Uh, if they're all $10,000 projects, then obviously we can fund many more. Uh, it will depend on which projects or which proposals rise to the surface uh, during our review process. But the whole point here is that we want these projects to positively impact learning at Penn State. And you'll see two things that stand out when we talk about the criteria in a second. The purpose of these, of these research initiation grants is to focus on innovation and learning. Those two things. Uh, and so those proposals that rise to the surface during the review process should be those that focus most on an innovative thing, something brand new or very novel, and those that will directly impact learning some in some way. As I said, not just online learning, but learning. Uh, I should point this out, multi-year proposals. Uh, we don't we don't actually accept multi-year proposals. RIGs are for one-year cycles. Uh, actually, funding goes for 18 months, uh, but that's just due to the logistics of things. Uh, 
your timeline when you submit will be for a one-year project uh, and then money will be available for about 18 months. If you have a two-year project, what you need to do is you need to submit the first year uh, plan. That will be the proposal that is judged. You can make reference to what a second year plan is, but when that second year comes up or when you're approaching that second year, you will need to submit a second year proposal to go through the same exact review process. Uh, and of course, during that second review, you can reference the outcomes from your first uh, cycle of, uh, of funding. But in general, we tend to discourage multi-year projects unless absolutely necessary. Big reason for that is we're looking at this as seed funding. Uh, we're not looking at this to grow the whole tree. We want to get you started so that then you can go out and get uh, larger funding, external funding, that can help bring your project all the way to fruition. Uh, and like I said, that may be at Gates, it may be an NSF, that may be an IES, whatever it may be. Uh, it's that, that external funding agency that will bring you all the way. Uh, this says funding announcement within three weeks. Uh, and every team, no matter whether you are funded or not, you will get extensive feedback on your proposal. Uh, I don't think any of you have been... We've had so many cycles now, I may forget, but I don't think any of you have been in the review cycle or the review process before. Uh, but you will have 8 to 10, possibly even up to 12, so let's say 8 to 12 uh, reviews of your proposal. The reviewers are highly encouraged to provide feedback and we facilitate that, that uh, feedback and then all of that feedback is then provided to you. What goes along with this is that these are not blind reviews. Uh, the Reviewers know the names that are on the proposals, and you'll see why in a second. Uh, one of the one of the primary criteria for funding is that the research or development team is able to pull off the project, that they're capable of doing what needs to be done. And there's no real way of doing that within a smaller Penn State community without just providing the names. Uh, we could mask them, but Quite honestly, it would be somewhat of a facade. Uh, we're small enough that many of us know each other, particularly many of us in this innovation space, uh, know each other and would recognize each other. Uh, so we just leave the names on there. We make certain that reviewers have no conflicts of interest, uh, and then we submit them to those reviewers for review. And then you will receive anonymous feedback. So in other words, the reviewers know who you are, but you will not know who the reviewers are. Uh, that will be completely anonymous, but you will get an, an enormous amount of feedback uh, based on all the criteria we're going to talk about in a second. Yes, uh, so the question is, do reviewer, is it helpful for the reviewers to know about prospective external funding? Uh, yeah, we'll get to that in just a second. That's actually one of the things we ask for in the proposal. Uh, I kind of just gave you this uh, proposal review. We have up to 50, uh, and that may even expand this time because we've had so many people reach out wanting to review for us. Uh, 50 reviewers, those are primarily Penn Staters, but not all. Uh, we have a, a number of connections in other universities, uh, and, and some of them sit in on the review committees as well, uh, particularly for some of the more collaborative research projects that come into the rigs. Uh, what I mean by that is sometimes we'll get a research team of 10, 12 people, and it's very difficult in that situation to find enough reviewers without conflicts of interest with those, those uh, team members. Uh, so what we often do is we bring in a healthy dose of those external reviewers uh, for those more well-connected uh, proposals. Uh, but about 50 faculty, staff, student representatives, we have very few students, uh, usually one or two. And typically, there has been concern before about uh, student reviewers who may not have the, uh, the breadth of experience in reviews or in the field uh, that uh, well-established faculty may have. And that's, that's a, a definite concern. We understand that. So what we tend to do is we tend to spread student reviews out across uh, multiple proposals so that a single proposal isn't reviewed by eight different students. It would be one student and then, and then a good healthy mix of, of more seasoned faculty and staff reviewing those. Uh, we, we take the review process very seriously and put a lot of work into determining who's going to review what. So, this is it, the proposal submission guidelines. 
this is exactly what we want you to send us. Uh, and it's pretty straightforward, but we'll run through it just to make sure there are, uh, there are, there's no confusion here. So first, there is a cover page. Uh, cover page is your standard cover page, title of the project, uh, names, titles, colleges, and campuses of all primary team members. Uh, in other words, if you have an uh, indeterminate uh, graduate assistant that's going to be joining the team, don't worry about that. Uh, but if you have five people on a team or ten people on a team, uh, mention those names. And this will be important a little bit later when we talk about uh, the criteria of can this team conduct this project. Having a collaborative group is greatly, going to greatly help your chances of being funded. If I'm not saying that you can't have get funding with one person, one PI, and, and that's it on the research team, uh, but you're going to have an uphill battle. Uh, so it's best to have a collaborative team. And one of the reasons for this is that we recognize that uh, the best people for, for completing or for bringing a research or development project to fruition, the experts, aren't necessarily the people sitting right next to you at the table. Uh, they're often the people who are across campus or across the country or across the world. Don't limit yourself to a team that, are, that consists of the people you already know. Reach out. If you need help reaching out, if you don't necessarily have those established connections, we are more than willing to help you do that. Uh, so if you have an idea, but you don't know how to get the right people together to, uh, to bring a proposal together and to conduct that research, reach out to us, reach out to me directly, and uh, we will leverage the uh, contacts that we have across the university and across across the world to bring those people to the table for you or to at least to set up some sort of discussion. Good example of this, I don't know if any of you participated in a COIL conversation, a, a virtual webinar we held uh, just last week or, or maybe it was, yeah, last week uh, with, um, with Conrad Tucker, one of our current RIG PIs. Uh, he's looking at going for an NSF proposal but he didn't feel as though his research team was diverse enough or, or it wasn't a collaborative enough team. So he reached out to us. We put together an event and brought together about 30 people to discuss his idea and see if they could cobble together a, a research team out of those that were most interested in his idea uh, and to bring new ideas to the table. Uh, so those are the types of things we can do as well as just putting you in direct contact with, with those that we know. Uh, between our, our, our four co-directors for COIL, uh, we've got a fairly broad reach across the university and across the world, and we should be able to help you with that. Uh, so that's names, titles, colleges, campuses, team members. Who is a principal investigator? We need one point of contact. Uh, so identify a PI, let us know who that is, and that will be the person that receives all communications from us, uh, and will be the person uh, that we will reach out to if we have any questions. You can have uh, co-PIs, but you still need to identify one of them as the primary point of contact. Uh, put in the date of submission, the amount that you uh, requested. Uh, yes, a graduate assistant is perfectly fine for the principal investigator. Uh, a faculty, staff, student, as long as it's a Penn Stater. Uh, it has to be somebody who's affili affiliated with the university, and that, that's perfect. You need to give us the names of the financial officer and the administrative assistant who will be processing expenses. If you don't know this, reach out to your administrative assistants in your department or your college and you can find this person. Uh, but this is the individual that's going to help uh, actually get the account set up to figure out how you're going to be processing payments for things, how you're actually going to go about the, proce the purchasing uh, process and the like. So we need to know who your FO is and who's going to actually be doing the paperwork. Uh, and that's typically an administrative assistant for a department. Uh, but it, it all depends on where you are and how your system is set up. Uh, give us those individuals' uh, names and contact information. The name of the human resource contact that will be involved in hiring uh, as well as management of the staff. Uh, so there are a number of new rules at Penn State related to hiring individuals. Uh, and it, we're not going to get into the details here because it's, it's uh, a typical uh, complex process, but giving us the HR representative for your college or department will be the starting point, and then we'll reach out to that person if you get funded uh, to, figure out, to figure out how, the, how everything will work. 
Uh, so I need to know your FO, need to know the administrative assistant who will be processing expenses, and need to know who the HR contact person is. And again, you can find all of that simply by reaching out uh, to your admin assistants in your college or department, and they should be able to direct you to those individuals and give them to get their names. I would recommend that uh, once you get their names, reach out to them and let them know that they are being included on this proposal uh, to give them a heads up. Uh, we've had a few surprised FOs before uh, that had no idea this was coming, uh, so it's usually helpful just to speed things up to let them know in advance. Uh, when funds are needed. So if there is a reason that you need funds immediately, there, there is some time-sensitive time component to your research, uh, make sure you let us know in there when that time period is. Or, the other way around, you're submitting for May, but you can't actually do anything until August or September. That's fine. Just just let us know when that is. Uh, and let us know how long of a period you look at spending that money. Is it going to be spent over the entire year? Or are you front-loading this and you're going to do everything in the first two months and then you won't have any money uh, spent for the next 10? Uh, well, actually, 14. Uh, so let us know that and just give us a sense. We're not going to hold you to that, but it gives us an idea. So when we're planning and trying to figure out uh, how this works, it will have a sense of what's going on. So this is all part of your cover page, single page. Following that, you can combine these next three into another page if you like. You could do them as separate pages. That's fine. They have word limits, not page limits. So we need an abstract. This is your typical abstract you would read, write for any sort of proposal uh, or, or research paper. And then these two items here. You need to provide us in 200 words, and we know that's short and it's on purpose, in 200 words, why is your project innovative? If you can't answer that right off the bat, then you need to sit back and think about the project that you're looking at submitting. We need to know why this is innovative. And we'll get to our definition of innovative in a second. <laughs> I just thought, yeah, uh, we're, we'll get to that. And that's a sticking point uh, very often. So describe why you consider it to be an innovation. And then provide us 200 words with how your project can impact learning, has a potential to impact learning. Uh, again, these are seed grants for these two things, innovative projects that can impact learning. So here we provide you the opportunity not buried within a narrative to tell us right there up front short and sweet how is it innovative how will it impact learning after that after you provide these and like i said the abstract the innovation and impact and learning could be on one page if you want uh, or you can separate them out that doesn't matter to us after that you get into the narrative this is five pages double spaced 12 point font uh, one side of page of the page only. These are digital documents, so that's less meaningful and, uh, now. But uh, these are these are the restrictions for the narrative itself. Five pages, double space, twelve point font. Uh, the following in information needs to be in the narrative. You need to give us a description of the online innovation that's similar to what's up here, but it's a little bit different. You now have you don't you're not limited to two hundred words here. Uh, you're limited to this five pages for all of this. So you can give us a description of the online innovation. What is it you're looking at doing? A list of research questions uh, or evaluation questions. Because if it's a development project, you may have uh, more on the way of evaluation rather than research. An explanation of the significance of the work. Why, why should we care? Uh, so give us the answer to that question. A description of the design or methodology or data analysis or development process. Uh, related to the project, if appropriate, uh, depending on what you're doing, it, this may not be an appropriate question. But if it is, please answer this. And uh, a brief description of any sort of research you've already done. Uh, is this a phase two of, of a project? You've already completed phase one? Let us know about phase one. It's going to greatly help or greatly impact your chances of being funded if we see that you've successfully done a phase one already and you're just looking at scaling it or you're looking at refining it a little bit. Now we're still in the five pages here, and we're to the description of the need for funding. Uh, so why? Why should we fund you uh, for this? Not just, not just the significance of it, but why do you need it? Uh, and why would Penn State care? Uh, considerable promise for enhancing Penn State's research reputation? That's, that's a valid reason. Uh, considerable promise for enhancing learning? That's a valid reason. Justify those things. 
plans for submission to external funding agencies. This comes back to Devin's question or uh, about external funding. Let us know who you plan on sending this out to, uh, if applicable, if you have someone, uh, and let us know. And that can give us a sense of the potential for this, again, in the criteria we'll get to in a second, the potential for this to bring external funding in. Uh, make sure you give us enough specificity so that our reviewers can conduct a review. Uh, sometimes proposals have been stuck in the abstract and just don't get to the concrete details that a reviewer needs in order to understand whether this is a valid uh, proposal or not or whether this is a valid research proposal. Give us some specificity and understand that the reviewers are not necessarily specialists in your area. They're going to be individuals from education, from engineering, from uh, the med school. Uh, we have a diverse group of reviewers. And so they're not going to be content experts or specialists in your area. It's possible, but don't rely on that. So don't get stuck in jargon. Uh, make it as accessible as you possibly can. And also give us a timeline for the study. So we're still in the five pages. We've got the, the narrative with this, we've got description for need of funding, the plans for submission to external agencies, the uh, timeline, and that conducts the entire or that concludes the entire five pages. All of this fits in five pages. Doesn't matter how much you break it up or how you break it up, just include this all in the five pages. Once that's done, then you get one more page for any references that you may need to include. Uh, so if you referenced anything in that five-page section, you don't need to take up space uh, with the actual citations. You can put that on a separate page. Supporting materials. Uh, this is the materials such as biographies of team members, so brief summaries of team members' capabilities as relevant to the proposed project. Again, one of the criteria we'll get to in a second is can this team do this? We need to know about that team in order to, to identify whether or not you can, uh, as well as anything else that you think of that may be important. If you did a pilot study already, give us some of the results. Uh, give us survey instruments. Give us uh, you know, videos of the, uh, of the stage one development or the beta project or a link to a website that, that's uh, you know, a, a beta sample of the software you're developing, whatever it may be. Uh, just if you deem it as something that may be important for the reviewers to know, you can include it in here. And you'll notice supporting material does not have a page limit. However, if you put in 70 pages of the supporting material, I guarantee you our reviewer is not going to read it. Uh, make certain that you keep it brief and succinct and that information that is going to be directly relevant uh, to this research project. The estimated budget. For this, you need to use the Penn State SIMS tool. If you don't want to know what the Penn State SIMS tool is, it's all the more important that you reach out to your financial officer and let them know you're submitting for this. And they will show you how to use the SIMS tool or they will do it for you. The reason we do this is because the SIMS tool makes absolutely certain that you calculate the correct rates uh, for those that are going to be paid and the fringe and, and, and the like that are going to be included in your budget. If you submit a budget, and you incorrectly figure any of the details, you did the wrong fringe percentage uh, rate for, for one of your staff, it is not COIL's responsibility to deal with that uh, after the fact. So we will fund a, a certain amount. If you find out that you miscalculated something, you will have to figure out where that extra money is coming from. And unfortunately, we've had this happen. So it is extremely important that you pay a, a lot of detail to putting this budget together and the SIMS tool will facilitate that, making sure that your budget is right. There's also a link to it. This is actually a hyperlink that will bring you to the SIMS tool, uh, although you need access in order to, Penn State access in order to get to it. So again, reach out to your FO and they can help you with that. Uh, don't forget fringe, you know that, indirect costs, uh, that's all part uh, of the SIMS tool. And for graduate assistants, make sure that you're budgeting for tuition and stipend. We had a nasty surprise during one of our early rounds. Someone you forgot to, to put in the, the uh, tuition. Uh, we caught it, uh, but unfortunately they had to completely rework their proposal and, and had quite a few problems because they had forgotten this step. Pay a lot of attention to this budget. Af in addition to the spreadsheet, so this is all budget spreadsheet that the SIMS tool will create for you. 
In addition to that, give us a narrative that describes what all of those entries in that spreadsheet are. So kind of walk us through that spreadsheet in a narrative. And uh, we will help you once, once you are funded, if you are funded, we will help you finalize that budget. We'll work with your, your FO in order to do that. You will notice there is no page limit here. Again, keep it as brief as possible. Finally, so we've gotten through all this. We've got the, we've got the cover page. We've got the abstract def definition of innovation and impact on learning. We've got the five page narrative. We've got the references, supporting material, the budget, and finally, the dissemination plan. One page maximum. Tell us how you're going to let people know about this work. Um, it can be through conferences. It can be through publications, uh, whatever you may come up with. So questions. Uh, what is meant by innovative? We're getting to that in two seconds. Uh, that's actually the next thing on the list. Pertinent research. Does that also include research in the field or specifically our own previous research, like you said? So uh, pertinent research can be broad references to the research base that's within the field, like, like a lit review. Uh, so that helps us to orient your project and get a good sense of where you are within the field. Like I said, the reviewers are not necessarily going to be content experts or, or, uh, or experts in your particular field. So they may need to be oriented to where your project fits in, particularly for understanding how your project is innovative. Uh, and so giving us some uh, some background like that would be great. Also, the pertinent research that you have conducted as well uh, would be also uh, very important, but it could be either or both. Uh, again, it de it's hard to say because it depends on the project, uh, but if it is something where the innovation is not necessarily apparent unless you understand where your field is or what your field does, then you may need to spell that out a little bit uh, for the reviewers, and you would do that within uh, within that section. Okay. Uh, this just tells you how to submit it. There's a link here to actually submit your proposal, and we also give you links to two redacted proposals that were funded. Uh, so if you're wondering what does this look like when it's actually done, here are two examples of uh, very highly rated proposals that you can click on, download the PDF, and you can look through the whole thing. Uh, all that we did was we went through and redacted all of the budgetary information, so we pulled out the numbers. Uh, but you can get a good sense of how it's, it's all laid out. Uh, one caveat, I believe one of these two, uh, I know, I believe one of these two, was done prior to us having the separate innovation and impact on learning 200 word sections. Uh, that was actually done for the first time in the previous cycle in the fall of 2014. Uh, so just remember that when you're reading these PDFs uh, that they may be missing that section and that is why that was not part of the RFP uh, for their cycle. So here we're getting to the innovation. You'll see first thing, first criteria, this is exactly what we provide to reviewers uh, for conducting your reviewer, your review. And when I do a walkthrough with the reviewers, this is what I give them. And this is what I walk through with them, is this criteria. Innovation. And I'm going to read this because the, the, we, we have worked so hard on defining innovation or trying to define innovation. And this is the, the, the verbiage we've come up with. COIL defines innovation as a research development or introduction of something new or novel, be it an idea, device, or approach with the intent of improving learning. That's about as much as you're going to get from us. Now I'll give you a few non-examples and that, that may be helpful. And one of the problems here is defining innovation is tough uh, because if you define it too much, you leave things out or you exclude certain types of things that would be innovative but you've excluded them based on your definition. And we don't want to dissuade people from submitting. What we do say is here are a few things that we do not consider innovations, where some confusion lies. One thing we do not consider an innovation is a refinement on an existing process or technology or approach. If it's something that's already being done and you just want to make it a little bit better, that's not an innovation to us. Somebody else might consider that an innovation. We don't uh, for the terms of these rigs. Also, we do not consider it an innovation if it is an application of an existing or well-established approach to a new context. Let me give you an example here. 
uh, we had one submission that was from uh, College of Nursing, and they wanted to take an online uh, collaborative video conferencing software and use it for collaborating between uh, individuals doing their internships or their residencies and uh, professors. And they said in their field, that sort of, that sort of virtual dialogue had never been done before. And so they considered it to be innovative. And for their particular field, based on what they said, it was innovative. But video conferencing is not innovative at all. It's well established, has been around for a long time, has been used in learning and online learning for a long time. So that is an application of a well established approach or technique into a new context. We do not consider that innovative. Uh, so make sure if there's any possibility of the researcher or the reviewers thinking that about your project that you spell that out for them, that it is not an, uh, an application of an existing technique to a new context and that it is not a refinement on an existing process. Uh, the question, can the research be done in another country or work with scholars from another country? Absolutely 100% yes. Uh, yes. Uh, we have uh, we just funded in our last cycle uh, a, a research project that is going to be done almost exclusively in South Africa uh, and many of the team members on the research team are from universities in South Africa. Great. Uh, in fact, that, to me that makes it all the stronger. Uh, so yes, absolutely. Uh, collaborative teams, the only thing that we're requiring is that the PI is from Penn State. Uh, the rest of the team can be from anywhere in the world. So you'll see innovation gets 10 points. Uh, so that's what the reviewers, if they feel that this is very innovative and we have a rubric that they use, if it's very innovative, you can get up to 10 points in this section. If they feel like it is definitely not innovative whatsoever, you can get one point. And this is the highest point value uh, that we give for any criteria is 10 points. You will notice that is that 10 points is also in enhancing learning. Uh, so basically, can this positively impact learning, or can this impact learning, or can we, can we understand more about the learning process through this research? Uh, make the argument for that within your narrative. Alignment with COIL themes, personalization, access, quality at scale. This is five points. Uh, COIL has a focus on these three things. However, you will notice personalization, access, and quality of scale are extremely broad categories. Uh, so basically, make sure you, you include in your narrative or in your wording, and this could be a couple words in a sentence, to make sure you couch it within one of those three areas. Is it improving? And by access, we don't necessarily mean uh, disability access. We don't mean, uh, you know, uh, closed captioning and the like, we mean access in those individuals who aren't typically or capable of, of uh, accessing learning in various formats. Does it improve the ability to, to get this learning or, or to get this information or this knowledge? Uh, so does it improve access, particularly for those who are, are non-traditional? Uh, personalization, are you helping to personalize learning? And most innovative things are going to fall in either personalization or access. And quality at scale uh, is self-explanatory. This is getting into the, the MOOC, the mock, the type areas uh, where you're making certain that uh, you're bringing things to scale, but you're also focusing on quality. Uh, so if your research has to do with any of those categories, make sure you, you mention that somewhere in your narrative. Is the R&D team well prepared to execute the project? This is five points. Uh, this comes out of that extra material at the end with your summaries of your research team. And this is where you're going to be greatly uh, helped uh, by having a collaborative group, a broad group, a diverse group uh, working on your project. If you're doing some sort of software development, there should be a software developer somewhere on your team. If you're doing some sort of hardware development, there should be some sort of engineer or or someone with experience with developing hardware on your team. Uh, so that's what's really going to feed into this section. Applicability, uh, does it have potential impact uh, beyond the specific research you're doing? And does it have potential for application outside of Penn State? Uh, again, we're looking at not just impacting learning at Penn State, but across the world. Uh, so we look at the applicability uh, here in this section, five points again. Cost effectiveness, seven points. Uh, if you're asking for $50,000, do you need $50,000 to do this, or is this a $10,000 project? Uh, this is where you're going to have a, a little bit greater scrutiny if you're asking for more money uh, 
uh, than if you're asking for less. Uh, so make sure you keep your request somewhere in line uh, and justify any of the re request for money that you that you have in there. Uh, that you'll do in your budget narrative is where you'll really tease this out. Feasibility, uh, can it be done in the time period? Is this a five-year project that you're trying to do in one year? Uh, or is the budget, is $50,000 just not even going to get you started? Uh, and and this is really the inappropriate place to be to be looking for funding for your project. Uh, so that's feasibility five points. Research evaluation plan ten points. You can read these bullet points to kind of walk you through it. But it's basically, do you have a research plan? Uh, you'd be very surprised how many uh, we have submitted that don't include any sort of research or evaluation plan, uh, and that they get docked ten points for that. And if you get docked ten points in any category, you're probably not going to to be funded. Uh, they we have very close running. Uh, usually funding is determined by, by four or five points. Uh, and so you, you really need to, to hit a home run on each one of these categories uh, in order to be funded. Potential to generate subsequent research and funding. Uh, this goes back to the question we asked earlier about external funding sources and identifying them. That would go here. And dissemination plan for three points. That was that last page of the proposal. How are you going to let people know about this? You'll see we have links to those highly rated proposals again. Some expectations of what we'd want from you uh, if you were funded, and we can talk about those if you do get funded. Here's where you'd click in order to uh, submit to be a reviewer for this call, uh, for this round. This is where you click to get this entire page as a PDF. And then here is where you can link uh, or where you can watch a recording of this session. We'll update this once this is done. Uh, probably uh, by the end of the week this week, we'll have this session uh, here hyperlinked so you can watch the recording of it. Uh, and you can also, again, transparency. This right here is a recording of the meeting we have with the reviewers to tell them how to review your projects. You can see exactly what they tell them, what we tell them. Uh, so you can get a sense of how your proposal is going to be reviewed. And that's about it. Uh, one other thing up at the top before I get to your questions. If you go under grants, so you'll see the what we've been working through today, the call for rig proposals. You'll see where you actually submit your proposal. You'll see where you can volunteer to be a reviewer if you are not submitting. If you're submitting, you, you're excluded from being a reviewer for this round. But you can also go to the and you can see all the projects that we have funded so far. Uh, so this can give you a good sense if you click in here and click through here and look at some of the uh, narratives and abstracts, you can get a good sense of what kind of research is being funded in these rigs. Uh, so that can also, I think, help you. And this can be helpful looking at the research team and what kind of people are included on these research teams. Uh, this one I click on here is actually a, not a great example because uh, uh, Conrad has quite a bit of experience uh, doing what he does, so he's got a small and focused team. But you can see some of the broader teams. Uh, uh, usually we have five to six individuals on a team is, is about average. We have some many more and some with, uh, with many less. So uh, let me look at questions here. Uh, the last one, are we able to run ideas by you to see if it passes the innovation criteria? So yes, um, we won't do it here because there's just there's no need for time to get in the specifics of that. And I will give a a caveat. I can give you my perspective. It is a very uh, informed perspective because I have sat in on every single one of these review processes. I have a good sense of how the review process, uh, how the reviewers think. I know exactly how they're directed, uh, and I know what my idea of innovation is and how I define it for COIL. And I will definitely give you, be more than willing to give you feedback on that. And uh, we can set something up to talk. And we can go through detail of what you're looking at, at uh, submitting. And I can give you my perspectives. That said, I cannot tell you how many, how many hours the four co-directors of COIL and I have sat around a table talking about proposals in the rig process and whether or not they are innovative. And each one of the five people at that table have a different idea uh, of whether it's innovative and why it's innovative. Uh, this is a difficult space to be in because it's ill-defined by its very nature. 
Uh, so what I can do is I can provide you with my perspective. Uh, I can provide you with what I think the perspective of the reviewer is going to be, and I can provide you with a perspective that I think can help you get a, uh, a higher score on your proposal for how to word what you're doing to couch it as innovative. What I can't do is guarantee you that uh, we're going to send it to the proposals that are going to agree with me. Uh, we may send it out and, and they would uh, vehemently disagree with me, uh, and that happens. Uh, so, yes, absolutely. Uh, I put my email up a little bit higher uh, in BAZ122. Uh, reach out to me, uh, send me an email, and I will be more than willing to set something up with you. Maybe we can uh, stop and have coffee and we can talk over it. Uh, I will be gone for the rest of this week uh, on my paternity leave, and on Monday I'll be starting back up half time. Uh, so we should be able to set something up uh, next week or the, or the week after uh, if you're interested. So hopefully that can help. I know that cuts it a little bit close with the submission deadline, but uh, I can try to figure out something next week. Uh, so send me an email. Any other questions uh, from, from anybody in the audience uh, uh, about the process, about uh, how we do it, about uh, what we're looking for? There is one thing that I that we do not have as of this very second on this uh, on this call for rig proposals page, and that is the rubric that is used for evaluating that we provide to the uh, reviewers for evaluating proposals. Uh, once we are offline right now, I am going to go on. I'm going to upload that, and I'm going to put it down at the very bottom. If we slide down to the bottom of this page, I will put it down. Uh, down here right after right after the criteria. So after number 10 here, I'm going to put in a section that says uh, download the rubric uh, for a review. Uh, and that way you can see the rubric exactly how it's, how it's stated. And like I said, you can get a very good sense of how this works. We try to be as transparent as possible. Uh, so if you have any questions, reach out to me. Uh, and we will do everything we can uh, because, you know, this is all in-house. We're trying to help each other here. Uh, so we will do anything we can to help out. Any questions? Give some appropriate wait time here. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, like I said, if you have any questions whatsoever, send me an email. I cannot promise I'll get to it this week, uh, but next week I will catch up on my, I think I'm 370 emails right now. Uh, which worries me, but I will get through that as fast as I possibly can as soon as I get back. Uh, and if you want to call me, oops, uh, there is my phone number, 814-380-9319. Uh, because we're working a little bit time sensitive here, if you don't get something back from, from me in an email on Monday or Tuesday, uh, feel free, give me a call. Uh, leave me a voicemail if I don't answer, and I will call you back and we'll set something up. Uh, like I said, if you're looking for a May submission, we want to make sure you get in there. Uh, if nothing else, if you submit in May and you don't make it, you get an enormous amount of feedback to refine your proposal for the November submission. Uh, and we've had an, we have had quite a few proposals that didn't make it the first time, but were funded the second time. Okay, excellent. Well, with that, uh, thank you very much. Uh, only went four minutes over. That's not too shabby. Uh, hope you have a, a great rest of the day, and I hopefully will be seeing your submission soon. Thanks.